Okay, welcome everybody. Today's Shear, thank you so much to our sponsors. Today's Shear is sponsored by Dina Birnbaum and Loving, memory of her mother, Moras Masha Basra Vietzchak Chaim, whose recent yard site was observed on Chav Cheshvat, and by Mike and Rena Friedman in loving memory of their brother, Edward Friedman, the Chronal of Racha. I hope you are staying well and staying warm this morning because and for those of us who have been outside, you know, it's kind of chilly. One second, let's see if you can see me. Here we go. I think that's working now. Good? We're good? Awesome. Yesterday was Rosh Chodesh Adar. So today we're going to share a remarkable, incredible, beautiful Purim description. We'll do that because that's the end, and we'll begin with the end in mind, the goal, which is to connect with the unique Masora of generations and help us appreciate and consider how we feel and we connect to Masora. So let's jump right in to today's letter. And I'm going to share this letter on the screen, and you're going to be a little bit surprised because it's not the letter that you thought we were going to talk about. It's not the letter that went out in the email this morning. We're going to get to that letter in a minute. But this is a different letter, which will help us appreciate the letter we're going to talk about this morning. So on your screen, let's see if you can see it now, you should be able to see a page from a website called Safaria which is an awesome Jewish resource. Can you see it on your screen? Safari is up there, excellent. You're seeing a letter that's not written in 1958, that is written in 1173. 1173. This is coined what we call Igeres Taimon, the Yemen letter. Hetika Rabbi Nachum Ma'aravi V'kor Shema Pesach Tikva, he called it Pesach Tikva, having to do with hope. Mini Ano Moshe, Rabbi Maimon Hadayan, Rabbi Yosef Achacham, Ben, Rabbi Yitzchak, Harav, Bar Ovadia Dayan, Zal. This is the text of the epistle of Rabbi Moshe Ben Maimon, Rabbi and Dinah Blessed Memory, in reply to a letter from Rabbi Yaakov of Yemen. Chizku Yadayim Rafos, Uberkayim Koshlos. Strengthen your weak hands and your unsteady knees. In Sulach Vodgoro Vakoro Shmar Varav Yaakov Hachman Echman Ayakar Hanechbad Vahan Yakar Vahanechbad Ben Kvod Mar Varav Nasan al Zal Ben Al Fiyumi. The letter is going to strengthen this honorable rabbi, the Chachman Echbad. Yaakov ben Rav Nesano, ubechlal kol alufiane achenu kol talmide kehilos asher be'eretz timon yishmerem tsuram v'yogin badam amen sela. A letter from none other than the Rambam to the Jewish community of Yemen. Why were the Jews of Yemen reaching out to the Rambam? Because they were in a terribly difficult situation. Unfortunately, they were beset by the confluence of anti-Semitic decrees, anti-Jewish persecution from the local Muslim leaders, and the, the ruminations and the presence of and the, the controversy over a man who presented himself as Mashiach, which, by the way, during times of persecution, it's you know, it's not a bad idea. If you're a false Messiah, that's a good time to show up, to tell people, hey, don't worry, it's going to be okay. I'm the Messiah. So is there, there is this terrible pressure from without and pressure from within. And so the leader of the Yemenite Jewish community sends a letter to Egypt, to the Rambam, and the Rambam responds in 1173. Now think about this, by the way, just by the by, how old is the Rambam at this point? Anybody know? Nope. 
not 43, close, very close. The Rambam was born in 1135. That means he's 38 years old. This is Greenfield, I saw that face. I agree with you. Whoa, could you imagine at 38 years old, he is recognized as the world authority in Judaism. So the entire community of Yemen reaches out to him and he responds. Remember, he's only 38, but he is the Rambam. And he's already become the Rambam by the age of 38. So the Rambam writes them a letter, and we're not going to go through this letter today, although it's certainly a wonderful and interesting limud. The Rambam writes that, to them a letter about prophecy, about nevuah. He writes about Moshiach, how to determine who is an authentic Messiah, who is a false Messiah. He talks about their suffering. Most of all, he gives them chizuk. He gives them love, concern, compassion, which you got just from that first word. I'll put in the chat for those who are on Zoom this morning. I'm going to put this link in the chat for you so that you can, if you want, you can afterwards or during this year, if you're not, you know, if you're not following along, you could just go on your own and read this Igeris Teman. It's now in the Zoom if you want to open it up for later. The Rambam's letter gives them chizuk. And this becomes a defining moment. This letter is a defining moment in the future trajectory of the community that we're going to focus on today, the Yemenite community, the Temanim. Temanim. And I have to tell you, I have Akara Satov to Dr. Guy Kesar. Some of you guys know, a prominent Yemenite member of our community. When I was starting to prepare this year, recently I reached out to him and I said, Guy, he, and he's a very passionate member of the Temani community. I said, I don't know anything about you, De Teman, and I'm going to talk about a particular letter from the most prominent, probably most famous member of the Temani community. And I, I need some I need some help. So he says, I have a whole bookshelf full of books, a whole bookshelf full of books. Uh, I borrowed one particular one, which we're going to get back to in the end. This community, this Taimani community is very old, centuries, centuries, centuries old. But what's interesting is that even though Yemen and the Taimani community was distinct and they were separate, they were not cut off over many centuries. They were not cut off from the main traditional Jewish community. You know, some of you know that there was a crisis. There was a halacha crisis about how to treat, what to do with uh, certain groups of Ethiopian Jews when they came back. I'm looking on the screen. I see people who probably remember those times. Are these people, are they halachic Jews? Are they not halachic Jews? Did they need to convert and there was a tremendous uproar in the, in the Olam ha, ha Torah to try to figure out what to do and how to relate to them. Why? Because they had been cut off from the rest of the Jewish world for so many centuries, from the halachic process, from the major principles of development of Torah. Not so for Yemenite Jews. If you want an interesting article on this from Rabbi Chaim Jackter, who traces this just in a brief sketch, I can send it to you later. He, has, he published in a New Jersey newspaper not too long ago. He quotes from Chuvas of the Gaonim. Chuvas of the Gaonim. So he's talking about more than a thousand years ago, letters that were exchanged between the rabbinic community in Babylonia, in Bavel, and the Jews in, in Yemen. And the Ramam in the 12th century is exchanging letters, of course, with them. And so what we have here, on the one hand, is a distinct Jewish community, but one that is not an island. They're not unto themselves. They had a unique set of customs, which we'll reflect on a little bit later. All right, I'll give you just a foreshadowing. This safer is what I borrowed from Guy. It's called Halichot Teiman. Halicha means to walk, the practices of Teiman. We're going to get back to it in a little bit. All about different minhagim of just one particular corner of Teiman. But in certain ways, it's interesting that their, that their experience, even though it was an, um, an Arabic experience as opposed to for many of us in this room, um, which was a more Eastern European experience, there were certain commonalities in terms of having great Torah leaders being devoted to tradition and suffering. In the 17th century, there was something called the Gullus Mauza. I think that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. I'm not 100%, honestly, I don't speak uh, 
pay money. Golos Malza, do you know what that meant? It meant that the, the local Muslim leader drove the entire Jewish community out into a barren desert and left them there. Golos Malza, half of the Jewish community of Teman died in the desert. Could you imagine? You know, Rahman al-Islam, we think about, and many of us are familiar about many pogroms and things like this. They had their own forms of pogroms. It, it, was a, it was a collective trauma for the entire Yemenite community. When they came back, and this is where things start to get um, developing in the, in the intellectual culture of Yemen, they came back from this, they rebuilt their community, and there began to be two approaches. There was kind of a split between the followers of two different rabbinic personalities. One was known as the Maharitz, and the other one was known as the Shsile Zaysen. Now, the, the approaches here differed in, in a very important way. We mentioned at the outset that the Rambam wrote a letter that became a defining moment for Yemenite Jewry. It was so defining that in the world of Yehudei Teman, they changed the Kaddish. We say, They added a line. I don't know how many of you know this. I didn't know this until I was doing the research. I never dove in a Yemenite shul. Maybe, I don't know if anybody does this today. They say, right? Moshe ben Maimon in the life, by the life of the Rambam. The Rambam was so central to the Temani experience that they changed the Nusach of the Kaddish with an honorific for the Rambam, a reference to the Rambam in the Kaddish. Bachaye Drabona Moshe ben Maimon. So, if you were a follower of the Maharitz, you said that all Yemenite Jews are going to continue to emphasize the centrality of the Rambam in halachic practice. Right? Think about it for a second. For many of us in this group, we're Ashkenazim. So, we Paskin based on a whole composite of Rishonim. And primarily, we are heavily emphasizing the Ashkenazi Rishonim. That's our tradition. That's our Masorah. So the Rambam gets a lot of weight, obviously. The Rambam, mi godol, mi Moshe, ad Moshe, lo kam kamosha. Who is like the Rambam? But we have Rashi, we have Tosos, we have the Rosh, Marami Rutenberg, Mordechai, etc. Oh, if you were living in Teman, you know, if you were living in Teman in the 14th century, there was no other person to talk about. It was the Rambam or bust. So says the Maritz, we're going to remain totally, ex well, I don't say exclusively, but primarily and in a dominant way following the Rambam. Not everybody agreed with that. The Shisilization said, wait a second, we are in many ways similar to this other Sparta communities in North Africa, in Iberia, in the Arabian areas. So by the 17th century, who is the dominant figure in the halachic landscape of Sephardic Jews, and not just Sephardic Jews, of course, but who is going to be? Anybody want to take a guess? You can unmute yourself. Who is the dominant force, 17th century, in halachic life, especially for Sephardim? Anybody want to guess? So someone wrote Nachmanides. So the, the Ramban, the Ramban is living back in the 13th century, also very influential, but not to the same extent in Yemen, not at all. The Rambam is the man. But who else? Who else? Any guesses? Rav Yosef Karo? Yes, Rav Yosef Karo. I couldn't hear who that was. The Shulchan Aruch. That's right. Thank you, Ronnie. Rav Yosef Karo, the Shulchan Aruch. So the civilization says, look, the Svarim, they follow Maran, the base Yosef, Rav Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. So we should go in that direction also. So there became two movements, which later, when I spoke to Guy, I didn't know anything about this. He said, you know about the, the Baladim and the Shamim. I said, I don't know anything. I have to do research. I have to learn. This became, this was the origins. This became the kind of two tracks in the Taimani community known as the Baladi group and the Shami group. The Shami group is more similar to traditional Sephardic approach. Now, by the way, even among Sephardim, we shouldn't oversimplify. You know, for, for many of us Ashkenazim, I shouldn't speak for anybody else. I see on this, this group, many very educated people. I'm just a regular guy. 
So what do I know? I was raised in Potato Kugel and Kishka and Eastern Europe. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know the difference between a Moroccan and a Tunisian, but I once had the opportunity to speak to the great, one of the great gems in the Chicago community, Rav Rakach. I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity to interact with Rabbi Daniel Raka. Rabbi Raka was explaining to me once the subtlety and the nuances between the Iranian Jews and the Syrian Jews. And right, it's, it's amazing. It's a whole world that many of us are not familiar with. So even we're not going to paint it all with one brush, but generally speaking, the Shamim said, we're going to be more similar to the general Sephardic approach. Whereas the Baladim said, no, no, we are Yemenite. We are Temanim. That means we are Rambam. We only wear one jersey. It doesn't say Maran on the back. It says Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. That's it. So certain Sephardim, certain um, Temanim, I once made the mistake. I was in shul. I don't want to say who it was. And there was someone who was there. And this person was a Temani. And there was the question, something about a Sephardic minhag. So I turned around and I said to this person, I said, so what do the Sephardim say? And he looked at me with almost like disgust. He says, I'm not smarty. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm just a, I'm just a guy from Galicia. I don't know. I, well, I'm so sorry. He was so insulted. He was insulted because the Baladim, they say, we're not just, or we're not Sfardim. We're Yemenite and we follow the Rambam. Oh. And then from this developed another movement, a subgroup of this, led, let's say, at the beginning of the 20th century by, the, by a man by the name of Rabbi, ya- I'm totally going to make this, uh, botch this, um, this name, Rabbi Yichia Kafich. Rabbi Yichia Kafich. He was one of the leaders of a movement called Dor Dea. The words Dor Dea mean the generation of knowledge. Some people, some people derisively called them Dordaim. This was a group of Baladim. They were so he was the Baladim, which emphasized, of course, the Rambam. And the Rambam is focusing on the rational aspects of Yiddishkeit. Not so much, right? We, in the world of the Rambam, we don't pay a lot of attention at all to Kabbalah or to the Zohar. So there became a movement within this group to make sure to perpetuate and emphasize the Rambam and not emphasize the role of the Zohar, which became a big controversy. So when I was talking to Guy Kesar, he said, you know, there was a big controversy, but it's not as big a machlokas as, as people make it out to be. I can't comment on this. I don't know enough about it. But if you're interested in it, you can look more into it. But who is this man? Rav Yafich, Yav, Rav Yechia Kafich. He is the grandfather of the author of the letter that we're focused on today that went in your email early this morning. The grandfather of the man who we call Rav Yosef Kapach. Just by a quick show of hands, how many people here whose screens are on have ever heard of Rav Kapach? Okay, we got one, maybe two, not very, con- oh, two, three, okay, great. So, so let, let's take a moment now to listen to Rav Kapach's own words, and then we're gonna introduce him. This is a translation of his, of Rav Kapach's translation of the Rambam. And remember, remember who is Rav Kapach? He's the grandson of Rav Yafi, Rav Yachi Kafich. His original name before it was Kapach in Israel was Kafich. Uh, Elliot wrote in, he knew his wife, Rabbanit Kapach. Yes, she was famous. I think they are the only couple in the history of the state of Israel that both the husband and the wife earned an Israel prize. He earned it for his scholarship. She earned it for his, her chesed. That's a whole nother incredible, incredible world. She died, I think, in 2013. He died in 2020. We're going to get to him in a second. But listen to this. Listen to Rav Kapak's own words. This is translated by a man by the name of Michael J. Bonin. When in my youth, I studied the Mishnah Torah with my grandfather of Boston memory. Most people used printed books, each with his own edition but my grandfather and several of the others had manuscripts which were several hundred years old, each scroll of a different age. The errors and deficiencies of the printed texts were well known, 
The changes that Maimonides made over time in the commentary on the Mishnah after completing the Mishnah Torah, he then inserted in the Mishnah Torah. These are all found in our manuscripts, but some are not found in the pr printed text. The Jews of Yemen are a conservative group. They would never have presumed to quote correct or quote amend a text that came into their hands and certainly not the works of the Rambam. However, the Mishnah Torah was subjected to severe editing by the printers and various editors who made emendations of style, language, the structure of sentences, and the division of halachos, to the extent that there is hardly any halacha that has not been amended. In this edition of ours, we are publishing, with God's help, the words of the Rambam in full as we receive them from his blessed hand. Skipping two paragraphs. I was especially motivated by the attachment of my grandfather and father to the ancient manuscripts. They spared no effort or resources to obtain complete and partial manuscripts, even single, purchase, single pages, purchasing at high prices and paying agents to search through Geniza to find any page or half page from the work of the Rambam. In addition to the searches which they conducted themselves. I've explored many commentaries which have explained the works of the Rambam over generations. You ready for this? And then we're going to change his biography. This is his own words. Before I reached my goal of 300 works, I was still short by about 25. I realized that I was no longer young and I decided to stop at that point. I hope others will complete the work, if not in my way, then in theirs. I will, not hold not, I will not hold back photographic copies of the manuscripts in my possession that can still be used, that can be used for editing the books of the Rambam. Rav Kapach said he was on a march, 300 works. Why? Because he's a baladi. Because he is a fierce, a fierce devotee of the Rambam and of Masora, of tradition of maintaining a fealty to tradition and halachic tradition and manuscript that need to be passed on over time because that's what he received from his father who received it from his father. Rav Kapach was born Yosef Kafich on the 27th of November in 1917 in Sa'ana or San'a, I don't even know how to pronounce it, in Yemen. His father was Rabbi David Kafich who died after being attacked by a local Arab Rav, Rav Kapach, little Yosef, was less than one years old, and at the age of five, his mother passed away. So here's a five-year-old boy who's totally orphaned, who's now being raised by his grandfather, this famous Rabbi Yechia Kafich, under whom he studied Torah. By the age of 13, Rav Kapach, little Yosef Kapach, had written an entire, he'd written the entire copy of the Rambam's Moravuchim in Judeo-Arabic. So think about the world in which Rav Kapach is being raised. His grandfather, his father, they are all, as he described in his own words, committed to perpetuating Yemenite tradition and specifically the Rambam. When he was 14, his grandfather died. It's just unbelievable. His grandfather died at 14. And through the whole story, he ended up being married off to an arranged marriage that same year. He worked as a, as a silversmith as a teenager. This man, Rav Kapach, who today, if you say the words Rav Kapach, is known as, you can't say the greatest, but perhaps the most influential uh, editor and rabbinic personality in the world of, of, um, of, uh, of Rambam studies of critical editions of all of Rambam texts, and not just Rambam, by the way. He expanded to other Svartic Rishonim. In 1943, he immigrated to Israel. He studies in Yeshiva Smerka Sarav, and then afterwards in Machon Harry Fisher, where he becomes a Dayan. In 1950, he becomes a Dayan in the, in the Jerusalem District Court, and he serves together over the next couple of years as a Dayan, together with Rav Avadya Yosef and Rav Lazer Yehuda Waldenberg, the author of the Tzitz Eliezer. If, if you could see on the screen, I'm going to share it with you. Tell me if you could see. You actually have here now on the screen a Psak Din. This is a Psak Din, a protocol signed by the Bezdin, 
Nochichim who are Rav Ovadia Yosef, Rav Kapach, and Rav Lezer Yudah Waldenberg. And Rav Ovadia referred to Rav Kapach with tremendous, tremendous respect. Rav Ovadia was the one who encouraged him to be on the Bezdin. And together with Rav Ovadia, there was actually a majority of Sephardim. Think about this which at that time in Israel was a big Chiddush, there was a majority of Sephardic postgame on this Bezdin. It was Rav Leidu Yehuda Waldenberg, the Tzitz Eliezer was Ashkenazi, Rav Kapach, who was Teimani, and Rav Ovadia, who was Lechuel Yosef, who was Sephardic. In 1970, he was appointed as a Dayan on the chief rabbinical court in Israel. And he sat together with some of the most famous rabbinic personalities of the 20th century. Who sat with him? People like Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim, the father-in-law of Rabbi Menachem B. Sachs of Chicago fame, right? Rav Ovadia, Rav Yashiv, Rabbi Ram Shapir of Mordechai Elio. He was the president of the Yemenite community in Jerusalem until he passed away at the age of 82 on the 21st of July in the year 2000. He's buried, he's laid to rest in Har Menuchos. Well, what a life. You know, I could pull off my shelf here. Probably some of you are familiar with this. The Mosad Rav Cook edition of the Pirush HaMishnais of the Rambam. So this is right off my shelf. You want to learn the Rambam's commentary on the Mishnayis? There's only one place to go if you want a serious edition. You need to look in this edition. Mosad Rav Kuf, Rav Kuk, who edited it? Yosef Ben Kvod Harav David Kapach. And dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of more. Off. Oh. So now, now, this is all just the introduction because this just gets us ready for today's letter. Because in 1958, the Halig of David Ben-Gurion, our friend Dave, he wrote the letter to the Chachme Yisrael. Well, who's he going to write to? He's going to write to Rav Kapach. Because Rav Kapach is not just a gon adir. He's not just a tremendous scholar. He's not just an expert in manuscripts. He represents a whole community. Who does he represent? Yehudei. Teiman. And now we're going to appreciate not just what Rav Kapach writes back in his answer, but there's a little, a little twist in Rav Kapach's letter that if you pay attention to it, you'll realize the significance of it in the context of everything that we've just described of Rav Kapach's background and his mission in life. So now we turn our attention to the letter, which you haven't, you know what, let me pull it up on the screen. So we're at 1958 now, Rav Kapach is a Dayan. And let, one second, let me make sure I can get it for you here. It's actually a, a pretty long letter, so I'm not going to put the whole thing up, but now, um, you know, maybe I'll, here. Tell me if you could see it now. Can you see the letter on the screen? Yes, okay, great. So you have it in your email. We're not gonna go through the whole letter, I want to focus on a couple of key points. The first section that Rav Kapach addresses, you see, uh, Yosef Kapach, Nachlas Achim Lud, Rechov Lud, Yerushalayim, December 12, 1958. It's a typo, it should say 1958. He's writing back to the Rosh Mem Shalah, and he's so humble. He says the first line here on the screen, Im Huanakli Tor Chacham, if you're going to call me a Chacham, I should be Meshav La'alacha, but you know, you already, you already know all the Gemaras, you for sure know all the Rambams and the Shulchan Aruch, so I don't have to tell you that. He's so humble. So now, the next paragraph is where I think it's, it's most interesting in Rav Kapach's letter on this point. He says, Aleph, I want to think about Hamunach Yehudi. When we say the word Jew, what does that mean? What is a Jew? And we spoke about this way back a little bit, uh, way back at, a little bit at the beginning of our series. And now Rav Kapach is going to get into it from his perspective. He says, Yesh Lomar, you could say, Ki munach ze eno misamel geza misuyam. You can't say that Jew is a race. He says, it's not nachon. First of all, it says something interesting. Ki, second line, kidei shelo lechakos as hagazanim. First of all, we shouldn't use that Hagdara because we don't want to imitate or be similar to racists of all those people. And therefore, he says, because we don't believe in racism, therefore the Torah, 
Betoras Yisrael, ain gzaim shonim ba'olam, third line. Rav Kapach's view is that there are no races in the Torah. Ukite lak or Torah zu, to get rid of this view, Huchicha Torah Senu, Laharach Bepirte Pradam told us Koboi Olam, Kite Liachsam La Avechodel Emachas. He says, Why is it that the Torah takes pains to explain how all of the different nations of the world, the Kafturim and the Kafluchim and, and the Toldos of Cham and Shem and Yefes, everybody, everybody, what they're all, what they're all about is to, ex, to explicate clearly that there's no such thing as racism because we all come from one father, one mother, Adam and Chava. We're all in it together. So that's number one. Lekach, maybe, Ula Yoser Loma, maybe you should say better. Can you see my uh, cursor as it moves across the screen, the screen to follow? You see it moving there? Does it work? Can you see it or no? Yes. Okay. Make it bigger, someone says. Okay, let me try to make it bigger. Hold on. Ho ho, we did. It works. Okay, now it's bigger. Okay. Maybe we should say, Maybe you could say that it's a tribe, but that's not exactly. You can't say that Jew means a tribe of people who are the descendants of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, because we know for sure keep a meshach koladoros throughout all the generations. This arbu behem rabbi me'amim ashonim. Many people join the Jewish people over the course of generations, all the way back from the Abraham that came out of Egypt, and then the Givonim in the times of Yehoshua, and the times of the Malchai David, etc., etc. That's it's obviously not limited to the people who are just the sons of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. What about all the Geirim? What all the Geirim? So now, parenthetically, he points out that, yes, in Chazal, there are different views of how to view Geirim, but, no, but nonetheless, for sure, there's no question that many people converted to the Jewish people over time. What about, maybe you're going to say, okay, it's not, it's not a race. It's definitely not a race. It's not just a tribe, Jews. We're not a tribe. Maybe, maybe we're just people of a geographic region. region. That's not true. Look where the people are living. There are Jews in Anglia, England, Burberry, Sin, Teman, Sforad, Germania. And even though these are people who are living in these, all these different places, they all consider themselves Jews. We're all Jews. Of course we're Jews. So now, what are we? Next paragraph. Elomar, you can't say, Yadus, Das, you can't say it's just a religion, Velola Um, and not a nation. Chalila, Chalila, not true. Ain't the Mitzvah Hamusogis, Hamusogim, Hamukubolim, Musag Shell, Aravi Yudi, O Kemoshesh, Aravi Nosir, Aravi Muslami, O Yudi Tsarfati. You don't say that somebody, generally you don't say this, that somebody is a, is a, um, a Jewish English. You would say they're an English Jew. So he says, He says, rather, there is a national element. There is a Loom, it's Gam Loom and Gam Das. When you say the concept of Jew, you mean somebody who belongs to the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation is one which is shaped by the Jewish religion. That's how he defines Jew. This Loom, this nationality, is Miskabesh, not through geography, not through patrilineal, matrilineal, through no uh, tribal affiliation, it's through Ayyadeh Kabbalah Das Mitsuyemes. It's a nation shaped by the acceptance of a religion. Garin Hauma, the kernel of the nation, who shave it Mitsuyam is a specific tribe, and maybe you could say, Imitirtse Emor Yotse Yerach Adam Mitsuyam, the core of the nation is a group of people who come from one person. Elashal Das Anyone who accepts a specific 
religion, harehu nasiach be'arag ne'arag umishtalei betoch shevet zeh. You can become woven into the fabric of this people, of this tribe, by this choice. Ad libeli heker that nobody will be able to know the difference. Bevchinas ki ava mongoim nesaticha. And now he quotes one important source. Go three lines later, you see where my cursor is. V'kach kosav harambam. Why is he quoting the Rambam? Because he's Rav Kapach. Because he's a Teimani. Because he's a Maladi. Of course, because he's going to, of course, quote the Rambam. And he's going to quote the Rambam in a letter. Uh, the Rambam in a letter to Rav Ovadia Ger. Rav Ovadia Ger says to, he writes a letter to the Rambam. He says, hey, look at Rambam. Although he probably didn't say hey, look, because he didn't speak Yiddish. He says, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, I'm a convert. When I say Shimon Esrei, can I say Elokeinu velokei Avoseinu, Eloke Avram, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov? Can I say that? My forefathers weren't descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and, Isaac and Jacob. So can I say that? Does that work for me? So the Rambam writes back to him, yes, you say that. Av Ravinu is your father also, because Avam is the Av Hamon Goyim. Anybody who converts to the Jewish people is the father of all those who become part of his descendants through conversion. So says the Rambam, you too, Rav Ovadia Ger, you say the regular Nusach HaBracha. This is how the Rambam rules also in his Mishnah Torah. And that's because, says Rav Kapach, the Jewish people are not an exclusive club. Anybody who wants to join our Le'um, which is under the contours of this das, of this religion, is welcome to join. He says something really interesting, which I would have never thought. He says in the next paragraph of the letter, he thinks that this is why, interesting, it's, it's a very sensitive topic. This is why, he says, converts can't be kings. He wonders. He says, maybe it's because if somebody converts to Judaism, what might happen is they might retain their connections in their previous culture. And they might want to marry someone from their previous culture. So Rav Kapach says, the Torah is instructing that person that when you convert, you need to marry and find a Jewish woman so that your children will be able to be malachim, that they can be kings and leaders because otherwise you're always gonna remain on the periphery. And so what we're trying to do is get people who are committed to further their commitment and their engagement, which I thought was very interesting. I never, I never heard of that as a pshat. Oh, so now says Rav Kapach, and I'll put it back on the screen. Tell me if you can see it. Now says Rav Kapach, now that we know what it means, the Musag Jew, okay, so he talks about this point about Mino Yisrara Me'ata Ben Acher, somebody who comes from another nation and who wants to call himself a Jew without going into accepting Giur Alfi Alacha without accepting conversion processes. In other words, accepting Kabbalah Sayados Lafi Chuki Ayados without accepting the title of a Jew without the parameters and the principles of Jews. How could he be called a Jew? Doesn't make any sense. It's impossible. It's not any different between an adult and a child. And therefore, he says, at the end of the day, we can't make that person a Jew. It's impossible. So the government can't make that person into a Jew. So it's, it's obvious, he says to Ben-Gurion, there's nothing we can do about this if the person is not halachically Jewish. Then he talks about the idea of sincerity in Os Beis, and then in Os Gimel. He then talks about, in a section Beis, he talks about the practical consequences of this. He says, have you thought, have the people in the office who are registering these people thought what the consequence would be? And we've alluded to this in previous letters of taking somebody who is not halachically Jewish, stamping on their registration card, Jew, and then they blend into Israeli society. This young, let's say, imagine a young man who after several years finds a nice girl, 
They start going out, they get serious, they get engaged, they sign up to register to get married. And the civil authorities are not in charge of marriage. The Rabbanut is in charge of marriage. They come to the Rabbanut and they say, we'd like to arrange our wedding date. And they say, I'm sorry, we can't marry you. He says, what do you mean you can't marry you? And the Rabbanut says, oh, you're not Jewish. Says Rav Kapach, could you imagine what kind of emotional destruction would be wrought on this couple? On this young couple? This, this, uh, this life could potentially be altered, he says, maybe forever to be struck like that out of nowhere. It would be shocking and totally, totally uh, devastating to them. How could you do something like that to set them up like that? You can't, you can't do that. Oh. But now we come to the last point that I wanted to, to share with you. And this is Rav Kapach's, let me put it back on the screen. This is Rav Kapach's marshal his marshal from the old wise folks of Teman. And now we can understand why Rav Kapach uses this reference. Where is it? Hold on. Let me find it on the screen so we can read it out. Hold on. Oh, we'll get it in English. Let me scroll, scroll down. Pardon me one second. Here we go. Can you see it on the screen in this connection? In this connection, I'll read it in the English. He says, I'm going to tell you, Ben Gurion, a story that I heard when I was a kid in Yemen. And in light of everything that we talked about today, why is Rav Kapach telling stories from Yemen? Because that's part of what his mission in life was. What HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought him here apparently for was to perpetuate this Masorah. In this connection, I want to recall the story of the Jew who was perplexed about recording his son's age. Shall I, he said, record him younger than he really is? He will be drafted into the army. Shall I register him as older? He will be subject to various taxes and levies. His friend advised him to record the correct age. That, said the Jew, never occurred to me. Never occurred to me. Just say it like it is. He says, Ben-Gurion, you're thinking like this, like that. We just have to call it like it is. Such a simple story. But what is Rav Kapach doing with that story? He's making a point, but he's drawing on his roots. It's the second time in the letter that he draws on a traditional Yemenite phrase or a pitgam or a story. And that book brings us to close with this book authored by, you see, Yosef Kapach on Halichos Teman. It is a beautiful, beautiful book that goes through, and here is a picture of Rav Kapach as he was a little bit older. It goes through Chai HaYehudim, the life of Jews, Betsana in the Tsana, in Sana and its area, in that area of Yemen. And he says, I'm careful to tell you that this is not the only way to describe Yemenite Jews. There are other n- neighborhoods or other areas where they had different minhagim. But it's about perpetuating. Rav Kapach wrote this. He wrote it, and it's incredible. He says he wrote this book collecting all of his memories of the Minhagim of Yemen right after he arrived in Israel. Why? Because he felt so alone, so lonely. He said he walked the streets of Tel Aviv and it felt so strange and he felt estranged. So he wrote down all of his, his memories from Taman in a book. He didn't publish this for 10 years, more than 10 years passed before he published this. But, but this is his life. His life is bridging for us a world into the world of Yemenite Jews that otherwise we would not have. So we'll close with a little description that he has here about Purim, as I mentioned at the outside. He describes first how on the afternoon of Erev Purim, the kids would make an effigy. They would make a, a man that looked like Haman. They would tie it up and they would drag it around and beat it up into a shmatas. And then they would go home after Kriya Samagila and have a feast. They have a beautiful breakfast. And after that, listen to this interesting minhag. The Bnei Mishpacha, the family members, who in that year had married off their daughter, after they would finish 
their Suda. It was the Minig in Sana that they would go to their daughter's house on the night of Purim. And they would bring fruit and sweets and dried fruit and fresh fruit. And they would have a whole plate. It was called Mashre Zajare. And they would have uh, a, a, a little, like a tray made out of copper with three legs. And they would cover it with a beautiful covering. Imagine like a, like a Friday night challah cover. They would put it over this tray. And it was called a tabak. And two of the Kala's friends or two of her relatives would carry this, um, would carry this tray through the streets to their house. And they would bring this gift to the young couple and they would sit and they would talk. And after that, they would wish them a happy and a healthy year. What a beautiful minig. Go to your married daughter's house and bring her, I guess, I wonder if it started maybe like a shalach monos, but tomorrow it's too busy because we're driving around in West Rogers Park and the one-way streets and it's so complicated so we don't have time, so we're going to go the night before. I don't know how it started. But Rav Kapach says that was the minig a window into life. And then he describes how the next morning they would wake up for Shacharis and they would start to give out what they called Matnas Purim. They would give most Purim, of course, to the poor. And then they would give Gelt, what we would call in Yiddish, Gelt. In the Ashkenazi world, they killed it most Purim to the children who came to Shul. And then I'll close with this last line. He says about the Sudas Purim in Teiman and Sana. He says, Shone Sudas Purim, he calls Sudas Achagen Vo'amoadim. The Suda of Purim is different than every other feast. He says it was like a Suda Shlomo. It was the, like the, the Suda of Shlomo Melech that they saw in the Taimani home. And he says it was a singular day. On, the, on that day, they had multiple kinds of beef. Sometimes they also had fish. They had wine. They had arak. And they would, and they would specify the different kinds of food for the different families. So something that, let's say, I would get... From, I, see, um, I see someone on the, on the screen, maybe Mrs. Greenfield. I would get from Mrs. Greenfield brisket. So then I see the Birnbaums are here. I would send them, you know, caviar. You wouldn't send the same thing that you got from one person to somebody else. Oh, you said it's good, right? So you say, this is the Minig. The Minig is, is that every, I guess maybe it was so they, nobody would think that it was being recycled, the Shalach Manus. You know what I'm talking about? The recycling Shalach Manus situation. And mitzvah gedola hila adam the shiyagish al shulchano biyom ze dafka mina yaim et hafshim shikivu mi yedidav kimishloach manos. And you know what the practice was? He says that when you would get shalach manos for somebody, you wouldn't toss it out. You wouldn't recycle it for somebody else. The minig was you would put it on your table, and you would make sure to eat from a little bit from that shalach manos. And you would pile up all the shalach manos on your table, and you would eat a little bit from everybody. When we celebrate Purim this year, obviously it's going to be different. It's going to be Yom Shishi and uh, it's going to be challenging. Um, and the truth is I can share Beinenu that I'm not going to have the opportunity to greet all of you this year as usual because uh, Mir Tashem, our family is going to be uh, celebrating, please God, uh, Purim this year with a small group of our family uh, celebrating a bar mitzvah in uh, with my, for my nephew's bar mitzvah, Mir Hashem. So we're not going to be home even. But, um, but even though Purim is going to be different this year, let's use Purim as an opportunity to connect to our Masora. Maybe we could think of one thing that we did as a child that our parents did or our grandparents did or something that Rav Kapach did. But Rav Kapach, his whole world, the world of Teman was the world of the Masora. And so thinking about what is our Masora? What do we connect with? Where do we come from? For those of us who come from Timan, what a rich and beautiful tapestry. And for those of us who come from other places, this letter, the letter of Rav Kapach, takes us back to the letter of the Rambam. It takes us back to the Yemenite Jews and the incredible, beautiful, I mean, if you want to even just from a, a pictorial standpoint, if you want to get a sense of what it looked like, how distinct their dress was, I'm showing you on the screen here, they have pictures of Yemenite dress, Yemenite children, what an important Masora to maintain, to recognize that goes back centuries, we should appreciate and maintain the Masora that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us. So I hope